And you got to believe that you can achieve anything in life. And, and once you conquer that, you will. You will succeed. And to, to look at that dream every day and stay focused on, on reaching those goals and those dreams, it truly came to pass for me. And in the first quarter of the game, I break my leg, dislocate my ankle. And I went to the combine on crutches and then the cast. And just about every team doctor looked at the injury being so severe that they didn't think I was going to play in the NFL. And all of a sudden, Bill Fralick and John Rady and a couple other linebackers started getting into argument. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is not going to end well. And all of a sudden... First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Brian Jordan, you're a former NFL player who I got to know as a teammate in Atlanta with the Falcons, but you also had an all-star 15-year career in Major League Baseball. You were a contemporary of Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders, although neither of them had the baseball career that you had. We'll dive deeper into that in a minute, but first I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, buddy, you don't have to thank me, man. It's a great pleasure to be on with you. Uh, you are truly an inspiration. Uh, I write children's books now, and I know you you write books. And, uh, you know, I'm just happy to be like you. And, again, man, you, a complete motivation, inspiration to me. And what a great teammate you were. And I really enjoyed playing with you. Brian. Let's go back to your childhood in Baltimore. You credit your mom, who was a teacher, and your dad, who was a steel worker, for your work ethic. Did either of them talk about it with you, or did you just pick it up from seeing the way that they were? Well, for me, you know, my parents are my role models. And, you know, my dad, not only did he, he was my favorite coach of all time, I can always rely on him. Uh, to sit up there in the stands like Buddha. He was a big man, and he never really yelled during the game. But after the game, uh, he would always correct my mistakes and never yell at me, but do it very professionally to where I, I got it. And I always relied on my dad, even at the professional level. And my mom, of course, was definitely an inspiration. Uh, and she taught kids with special needs and that just motivated me and inspired me to not just be a two-sport professional athlete, living out my dreams, but off the field, being somebody that's going to make a difference in life and give kids hope. And uh, they were my inspiration, uh, my parents. And, you know, as a child growing up, all I wanted to do was be better than my dad because he was such a great athlete. So that inspired me to always work hard, never give up on my dreams and keep trying to be better than my dad. And if I do that, you know, when maybe I'll reach my dreams, which I did. Uh, but I give that the credit all to my parents for really pushing me, staying behind me, uh, always being there for me. And uh, so that's that's how I turned out the way, you know, the way I turned out. Did your granddad ever say you passed him or did he say your dad still had you? Mm-hmm. Never, never. And, you know, as a kid, you know, you stick out your chest when you score six touchdowns, run for 250 yards. And you, you, all I wanted to do was brag to my grandfather and, and prove that I was better than my dad. And he would always look at me and say, well, your dad would have scored seven touchdowns and ran for 300 yards. <laughs> so as a kid, you know, you deflate it. But as I grew older, I got the message that he was saying, never stop working hard. Always try to get to seven touchdowns, 300 yards, 
to beat out your dad. So I never did it, but I always tried, and it always made me better and better, and it made me into who I am today. Did you ever get to uh, – did your granddad get to see you make it to the pros and all that? Did he get to live that No, out? unfortunately, he didn't stay alive long enough. But, you know, again, I give him all the credit in the world for, for teaching me those valuable lessons when I was young. Did you have any siblings, and did they have any influence on you? You know, amazingly so, I have a, a twin brother and sister, both older than me. My brother played sports. Uh, again, I always wanted to be the best in the family. And my sister was probably the, the, the best athlete in the family. I mean, she played softball, basketball, volleyball. And she was really, really a dominant athlete. And I always competed against her. And, you know, she was sort of that person that, that motivated me to be the best, too, because she was such a good athlete. And uh, we just had fun competitions together growing up, uh, both my sister and brother, really. Uh, but at the end of the day, I just wanted to be better than my dad and all my siblings so <laughs> it, it, it worked out in the end <laughs> were you a big sports fan as a kid did you watch a lot of games on tv or maybe you got to go to some games with your folks wow i loved all sports it didn't make a difference to me basketball is my favorite sport to be honest i mean i was a huge uh kareem abdul magic larry bird i mean i grew up uh admiring lynn bias who was probably one of the greatest athletes that unfortunately made a bad choice in life and, and, and cost him his life. Uh, you know, Lynn Bias was the reason why I wanted to go to the University of Maryland. Uh, when they recruited me, I got a chance to sit behind the bench and watch one of the most explosive athletes I've ever seen. I mean, he, I think he was better than Michael Jordan back then. You know, that's how good he was. And he was the first pick of the NBA draft by the Boston Celtics. And when he got drafted first round, a chance to play with Larry Bird, it made my whole year. And I remember that night after he got drafted and the very next day I was headed to work, it was announced that he used cocaine and died. And for me, you know, things happen for reasons. And to see one of my idols die by making a bad choice and using drugs, it really kept me on a straight and narrow to never, ever want to try using any type of drug, just focus on my career and being the best. Uh, but, you know, it, that was a tragic moment in my life to lose limb bias, but also, again, learning valuable lessons on what not to do. And, uh, you know, that was a trying time in my, in my life to see that. But University of Maryland was the school, my dream school, and unfortunately, I, I didn't go there because Bobby Ross wouldn't let me play two sports my freshman year. And I decided to go to University of Richmond, which worked out pretty good for me. Did you ever see that the 30 for 30 on Len Bias? It's so good. Yeah, I did, man. I did. I watched every documentary on Len Bias, man. Uh, again, you know, I idolized them growing up. So yeah. bad choices, bad choices. I'm sure that you dreamed of being a professional athlete. But when did you realize that it was a real possibility? Well, when I was nine years old, uh, I was blessed to have two parents in the household. Uh, and my parents encouraged me to write down that dream. And I wanted to be different. You know, I didn't want to be like everybody else. I wanted to play two professional sports at nine years old. And they made me write that down and put it on my wall. And my mom being an educator, of course, this didn't stop by writing down that dream. She made me write down goals on how I'm going to reach that dream. Wrote down my goals, and every morning I would touch that wall before I went to work. I mean, before I went to school. And it really just kept me focused. Kept me focused, and, you know, they got me to, to believe in myself. And that was the most important thing, something I preach to kids today. You got to believe that you can achieve anything in life. And, and once you conquer that, you will. You will succeed. And to, to look at that dream every day and stay focused on, on reaching those goals and those dreams, it truly came to pass for me. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to go to University of Richmond, play two, two sports there, and also graduate. My mom made sure that that was the, my number one goal to get my education, which I did out of University of Richmond with a sociology degree. 
And I was blessed enough to play two professional sports and got a chance to play with my teammate, Tim Green. <laughs> you know, one of the most exciting players of all times. I probably got hit harder by Tim Green than anybody <laughs> on the field just in celebration. Uh, but one of the guys that I looked up to, uh, not just because the way you played the game, but the emotion that you brought to the game and just the intelligence that you had. You know, you don't see a lot of football players that's really smart and, and play as good as, as Tim Green. <laughs> Dad, that's probably one of your old teammates just reached out to my uh, dad on Facebook and they said, I remember – you reading, uh, he said, I can still picture you reading books in your locker room before we went out for kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was amazing. I mean, so many guys get prepared for games so many different ways. I mean, one of our teammates, Bill Fraley, he used to knock his head on a freaking locker, you know, just getting motivated. And you look over and see Tim Green reading books, you know, just getting that relaxed feeling and, and whatever it takes to prepare you for a game. I've never seen guys read books like Tim Green before a game, but uh, it was definitely interesting because once he closed that book and got ready for the game, he was a totally different animal on that field. And and I loved it. I, I loved it. And again, it, it was a motivator for me, you know, to see intelligence, but yet, you know, have that different side of being a great football player at the same time. I mean, you know, what a role model, what an example. The way I was on the field is what put me in this chair. I had no regard for my head or health whatsoever. I remember when you would make a big play and just running over to headbutt with you to celebrate. But this is my reality, and I am blessed to be here. I am still able to do many things like enjoy my growing family, to get right with God, and to share my good fortune with those less fortunate because Jesus said, invite the poor, the lame, the blind, because they cannot repay you and you will be blessed. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it, man. Well said, Tim. And, and I love you for it. And we all got to pay a price, but as long as we pay it with the man upstairs, Jesus, you know, we'll always be successful. So what you're doing and, and what you're living right now and being a great example, uh, it, it, it's making a difference, believe me. Uh, and I was so blessed that your son called and reached out to to get me on the interview, man. Because, uh, uh, again, I get to tell you how much of a blessing you are to so many people out there uh, that may be going through what you're going through, uh, but still making a difference in life. And I think that's the most important thing, man. Not only are you being there for your family, but you're being there for so many others. And, and man... Nothing but love for you, Tim. That's how Brian, when he had it, he was, we were, uh, we were not telling anybody. We were very private about it. And then mm -hmm. ultimately I was saying to my dad, I think he should be public about it. And he still didn't want to. And I said, uh, I'm like, you know, don't do it for you. There's somebody out there who doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the name, doesn't have, and you coming forward is going to give somebody hope. And that was ultimately yeah. what, what made him do it. So yeah, it's That's good. Awesome. And that is awesome. That's like my mom, you know, teaching kids with special needs giving those kids hope every single day that they are no different than anybody else. They can be successful in life if they believe it. And, you know, that just carried on through me. And that's why I write children's books. I'm in elementary school space, uh, motivating and inspiring kids to read. Literacy is such a huge issue now today, especially through COVID. And all I want to do is make a difference. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Were your parents always reminding you to study and have a backup plan? If so, what was your backup plan if professional sports didn't work out? Well, again, my mom, she always stressed education. I was drafted out of high school uh, in baseball by the Cleveland Indians. And, you know, as a kid, just so excited. All you're thinking about is, man, I can buy a car. I can do this and that. And my mom would not even let those guys in the door and the scouts because she wanted me to make sure I get my education first and always have that plan B, C, D. For me, I, I, I majored in sociology, but minored in criminal justice because I wanted to be a, either FBI agent or a CIA agent. Uh, so that was my backup plan. And, you know, I grew up loving Superman. So I wanted to be a superhero and protect the world. So that was my backup plan. And thanks to my mom, just really pushing education. 
uh, pushing a, a, a plan B because, you, as you know, you never know what happens in sports. So I was always ready to go with that plan B. What was that like getting drafted in high school? I mean, that must have been a pretty surreal feeling. Wow, it was, man. Uh, you know, I was pretty excited. And, you know, as a kid growing up in the in Baltimore City, you know, you just want to get out. You, you just want to make money and, and move on. And uh, and that's the way I felt, you know, working so hard and, and being a, a high, well, would have been a very high draft pick if my mom would open the door. But I still ended up getting drafted 23rd round, I think it was. And uh, my mom and dad, they offered me like first, second, third round money. And it didn't matter because my mom was going to make sure I went to college. So that was very unfortunate for me as a kid. But it always pay out when your parents, you know, make those decisions and, and it works out in the end. What were some of your favorite memories from high school? Wow, my favorite memories from high school was being captains, being a leader. Uh, really, I, I guess I can, one of my most memorable experiences when I, I walked off the field in football because I was a leader, I was a captain, and I remember my knee was hurting and I wasn't leading all the drills and my coach was just, I mean, really cussing me out and, and, and pushing me and pushing me to where I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I walked off the field and, you know, basically quit the team. And I, I don't remember stepping my foot in the door going home and my mom being a teacher at my school already knew what happened. And boy, was I in trouble. My dad just laid into me and really taught me how to be a man, how to accept responsibility, how to, you know, when the coach is talking to you, you know, you respect that. You understand if he's not yelling at you, you know, you're not that good. If he's yelling at you, then he sees the talent and abilities in you and wants you to be successful. And uh, I remember that experience going back and apologizing uh, really helped me in the long run uh, of my career. And, you know, getting to the state championship, winning the states in, in basketball, uh, you know, getting to the states in baseball, uh, to me, it, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to win. It taught me how to be a leader, uh, how to make everybody around you better, uh, which are important lessons, I think, in any young man trying to be successful in, in anything that you do. You have to step up as a leader. And through high school, that's I learned a lot and learned how to be a leader. Did you go, did you win states in all three sports? No, I made it to the states in all three sports. Didn't say we won, but I made it to the states in all three sports. <laughs> Unfortunately, I lost in the states all three years. Did they all uh, did all of them come naturally to you, or is there one of those three sports you had to work harder at than the others? No, man. I'm gonna be honest, man. Basketball is my favorite sport, you know. But reality said, and I was just six foot, and I wasn't a point guard, you know. So I was like, I'm not gonna make it to the NBA in that. So I better stick with football and baseball where I had a chance. But I did have scholarship offers in basketball too. <laughs> that's crazy. And what's crazy, you know, playing with the Falcons, that's all we did. Deion Sanders, Andre Rosen. I mean, we had some great athletes, man. That's all we would do is play basketball in the off season. Dunk contests and all kinds of craziness. Who was the best? Man, phew, Deion could fly, man. He could get up. Andre Rosen, I think, probably was the better basketball player than all of us. He was really good. But Deion had the had the hops. He had some hops, man. I remember that uh that dunk contest. Well, I'm trying to think what ESPN or CBS had a dunk contest. Barry Sanders was in it. Barry uh Barry uh Barry Bonds was in it. Michael Irvin. It was a pretty good dunk contest. Yeah. I just funny to say I just saw that like not that long ago it popped up for me. I saw Dion Duncan in the dunk contest. Yeah, I saw the same thing, man. I, I saw the same thing. That's what reminded me of it. I, I, I was at UC, down at UCF for playing football, and Prashad Paramount ended up being a first round draft pick. He was a wide receiver. We were playing basketball in the off season, and I remember I was nowhere near the world of athlete that he was. I mean, he was just uh, freaky. And he was yeah. wearing, he was wearing flip flops, and I was guarding him, and I was I was on I was playing football defense where I was fouling him every second, right? And he, and he jumped in flip flops. He had his back to the rim, and he jumped. He just kept going up and kept going up and kept going up, and I'm fouling him, 
and he jammed the ball. I'm like, how is that even humanly possible? <laughs> like, how did that even just happen? But that is dangerous. It's some flip flops. So. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, that's that's a great athlete can do that in flip flops, man. Yeah, there are levels to it. Yep. <laughs> were you in the Falcons? It was Jumpy Gathers there when you were there. Yep. So yep. Jumpy's nephew, his name is Clayton. He was with me at UCF too. Oh, really? Yeah, he ended up. He played for the Colts for I don't know eight years, something like that. He was a good player. Uh -huh. He was a safety. Safety. Okay. But it's funny because him and I were both there, and I didn't know – I had no clue he was related to Jumpy. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and even he didn't know, you know, my dad and Jumpy were teammates. And then my dad came and did, like, a talk at one of our, I don't know, preseason luncheon or something like that. And right. Talk about the Falcons, and then he called uh, – Clayton called his uncle, you know, called Jumpy. And he, my dad used to tell me about Jumpy growing up. He'd walk, <laughs> in, the, he'd walk in the weight room and be like – Coach, because you never lift weight, never really lift weights, I guess. And then the, right. the coach, naturally strong. Yeah, the coach would get on him about never lifting, so he'd come to the weight room and be like, "Is this enough, coach?" And he'd have like I don't even know, four hundred pounds on the bar, and, and the coach <laughs> would like snicker, yeah, 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 jumpy, try and bench that. And he said he would rep it. He was, the coach would think he'd not be able to do it once. He'd rep it like three times. Look at the coach, and be like, "Is that enough?" And the coach would be like, "Yeah, just get out of here." <laughs> <laughs> Some people got that natural strength, man. The forklift, right? Was that his move? Forklift, yeah. Forklift. I was used to laugh about that with my buddies because think about how strong you have to be to lift up. Often, not just lift up to 300 pounds, but those offensive linemen were mean, mean <laughs> SOBs. Yeah, we had some good ones, man. Bill Fralick, Houston Hoover. I remember all those. Jamie Dukes. Yep. Mike Gann. I think Mike Gann and my dad were, were roommates, actually. For Oh, what, roommates? Yeah. Yeah. Freilich really took me under his wing, except when we were trying to smash each other during inside run drills. Brian, you were such an amazing high school athlete. I'm curious what made you choose Richmond? Well, I, I actually, University of Maryland was my dream school. Uh, but when Bobby Ross told me I couldn't play two sports my freshman year, I had never went on another trip because I had a scholarship from Maryland my junior year. So I turned down all trips, all schools, and I had a lot of scholarship offers from all around the world. But the fact that I didn't visit those schools, I ended up going to University of Richmond because they were closer. Uh, they would allow me to do both sports and academically, it was just a really, really good school. And I knew I would go to class every day and I would be missed in the classroom. So that was a huge reason why I picked University of Richmond. They would allow me to go out there and, and play football, baseball, and, and really look after me academically to push me. Uh, so it all turned out great at University of Richmond. How did you balance academics, Division I football and Division I baseball? Playing just one sport in college is such a huge time commitment. Two must have been tough. It was a it was a tough balancing act for me, you know, especially as a freshman uh, going in and and trying to prioritize my time. Uh, I'm just thankful that I had a really, really good counselor who stayed on my butt, uh, wasn't afraid of me and and made me go to tutoring, made me uh, not miss a class. Uh, it was something that the coaches were really tough on us about you know, missing class. I knew I would get discipline on that sports field if I missed class. So I was, again, I was very blessed to have a great counselor staying on top of me, pushing me because my mom and dad forced her to push me uh, since they were not there with me. Uh, so again, I knew what I was there for to graduate first and have the opportunities to live out my dreams by playing both sports. And uh, I was very fortunate to have that opportunity at Richmond and, and really accomplish all those goals. Who along the way taught you how to read a baseball pitcher? I got to say, who taught me how to read a pitcher? I got traded to L.A. and Sean Green, who used to play with the Blue Jays. He was my teammate out in L.A., and he was probably the most 
interesting player I've ever played with. He could go in, watch video, and tell you every pitch that's coming. And for me, I didn't want to know because if I knew what was coming, I would probably be anxious and jump out there and pop it up or something. So I never really asked him except when Kurt Schilling came to town, who I could never hit that split finger that he threw. And I went to Sean Green and he told me, look, when he puts that glove over his head and flares that glove out, the split finger was coming. And it was amazing. I went up there, and every time he flared that glove up, I never swung at another split finger out of Kurt Schilling. And all of a sudden, I started hitting him very, very well. So I, I got to say who taught me the most lessons, Sean Green. He taught me how to read pitchers. So until that point, like when you were in high school and when you were in college, you would just kind of feel it out? You just see it on the fly? Hey, see ball, hit ball. That's That was my honor. <laughs> You know, you really got to catch the spin out of his hand. And when I got to the big leagues, you know, they always challenged me with the fastball my first couple of weeks. And I started out like I'm going to be the next Hank Earn because they throw me a lot of fastballs. But all of a sudden, they started throwing curveballs, and I couldn't recognize that spin. And I got sent back down to Triple A, or really, I got sent down to spring training. And a coach got me up at 7 in the morning for a whole week straight, throwing me nothing but curveballs. And I could recognize that spin finally. And that was my favorite pitch to hit ever since then. And got back in the big leagues and never came back down. So I learned a lot along the way. And I was blessed because I didn't play a lot of minor league games. I just I was playing in the NFL, playing minor leagues. I would play 30 minor league games. And then I'm back on the football field in the weight room, lifting to get stronger, putting weight on. And so after my third year, of course, I wasn't ready to give up football. But Cardinals paid me a lot of money to give up football. And I decided just to stick with baseball. And that's when I really learned and took off. And, you know, pretty fortunate to play 15 years of Major League Baseball. So when you came out of college, you were, were you drafting the NFL? When I came out of college, uh, I was drafted by the NFL after the senior bowl when I broke my leg and dislocated my ankle. Uh, I was supposed to be one of the first or second safeties taken in the first round. And in the first quarter of the game, I break my leg, dislocate my ankle. And I went to the combine on crutches and in the cast. And just about every team doctor looked at the injury being so severe that they didn't think I was going to play in the NFL. Hmm. And in three months, Buffalo drafted me in the seventh round still. I didn't even think I would get drafted. And I get drafted by Buffalo. I show up to minicamp after three months with a plate and screw across my ankle, running straight ahead full speed, and I was ready to play. And they looked at me like I was crazy because they couldn't believe that I was ready to play. And they helped me out until training camp, of course. And I led all DBs and tackles, so I thought I really made Buffalo Bills. And Marv Levy calls me in. Uh, I thought I made the team because nobody came and got my book. So I get down to the uh, facility. I'm working out in the weight room, and Marv Levy calls me in his office and says, I'm the 46-man on a 45-man roster, basically. Oh, man. And that was the first time I was ever cut in anything. And I remember, you know, almost having suicidal thoughts at that time, man, because, you know, I've never been turned back from anything. And I felt like I was a huge disappointment. You know, how can I tell my family I got cut? And uh, I remember that walk to the, the parking lot. And then my agent called me and he was like, look, you're on a flight to Atlanta. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> I just, you know, looked at all the hype about Deion Sanders going to the Atlanta Falcons. And the next thing you know, we're teammates, get to meet Tim Green and, and a whole new new team, you know. And that was after Bruce Smith and Cornelius Bennett in Buffalo, uh, one of the best defenses in the league at that time. And, uh, man, what a turn of events. But it worked out great. Ended up starting three years for the Falcons and, you know, looking at a really good career. 
when you got hurt in the senior bowl, would that have messed up your baseball career too? Or you, or were you already secure at that point, at that point? Well, yes. I mean, playing a different sport, you know, contractually, you know, they could have said, Hey, you're injured in football. We're out of our contract, but no, they actually did the surgery. Uh, they wanted to see me get back on the baseball field, but I wasn't ready to give up football. So they were a little disappointed at that time that I still wanted to go play football. But, uh, you know, I wanted I wanted to reach those dreams, and uh, fortunately I was able to do it. Was anyone in your life kicking you, saying, just play baseball, man, stop getting – give up football? Wow. Troy, I, can, I can't tell you how many times – People told me, just pick one sport. You could be great at it. You'll be a Hall of Famer. You can't play two sports and be successful. Uh, I heard the stories all my life growing up because, you know, once people knew my dreams, they always tried to talk me out of those dreams. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't going to let them do it. Uh, My parents said, hey, dream big. No dream is too small. And uh, I took that to heart. And that, that was my focus. I wanted to do it. I wanted to be different. And I stuck to it. I stuck to it, and thankfully I got the opportunities to stick to it, and it worked out perfectly. But I'm still a Rodney Dangerfield of two-sport athletes. I get no respect. (laughs) (laughs) Did you want to try to play two professional sports at that point? It seems like baseball was so much closer to becoming a reality. That injury almost cost you both. Well, for me, I... Again, my dream was to play two sports. And my junior year at University of Richmond, uh, we got a chance to play against the the Richmond Braves, which was the triple-A team of the Atlanta Braves. We played them in an exhibition. And to be honest, Tim, I didn't even – I wasn't even thinking about getting drafted in baseball. That was my junior year. I knew I wasn't going to play another year of football and maybe make that decision as a senior. But – I had such a good game against the Richmond Braves and Triple A being one step away from the big leagues. I remember hitting against Derek Lilliquist, who was their top prospect, uh, one step away from the big leagues. And boy, did I have a great game against Derek Lilliquist. And after that ball game, the St. Louis Cardinal scout came up to me and said, hey, we want to draft you first round. And I'm looking at him like, what? I'm not even thinking about baseball like that. And you know, I said, hey, well, you know, whatever. And I remember calling my dad and my mom, and I said, hey, this scout came with me and said they're going to draft me first round. Should I believe him? <laughs> and next thing you know, draft day comes up, and I'm drafted first round by the Cardinals. And I told him I would sign on a condition that I could come back to college, play my red shirt junior year, and then graduate, and then go and and." Then make a decision. And so they ended up drafting me, signing me. I uh, went and played 30 games in their rookie rookie league, hit over 300. And I was getting ready for football after that. And next thing you know, uh, I get drafted. I have a great redshirt junior year. And I get invited to the Senior Bowl, which Dan Reeves of the Denver Broncos at that time, his coaching staff coached me that week. And I went from a projected third-round draft pick at cornerback to one of the first or second safeties going to be taken, me or Steve Atwater. And that year was just a great core of safeties. Carnell Lake, you had Benny Blades. I mean, it was a lot of great safeties coming out in that draft. And, you know, the fact that I played with Dan Reeves, I knew they had, I think, the eighth pick in the draft. So I had a good chance of being eighth pick in the draft. And in that first quarter, chasing Cleveland Gary across the field, my, only, my teammate takes me out, break my leg, dislocate my ankle. And uh, that really changed everything for me. And uh, Buffalo still drafted me in the seventh round. Uh, so I definitely wanted to give football a shot. And I was fortunate, again, to play three years with the Atlanta Falcons and uh it all worked out great. 15 years later, Major League Baseball, I headed to the broadcasting booth. And uh, here I am today after writing children's books. So it's been a journey and a, a very good journey. I think if my son got drafted in the first round of the MLB, I'd say, you're crazy to play football. Go. <laughs> <laughs> the Bills were crazy to let you go. 
How soon did the Falcons pick you up after the Bills cut you? Well, when I got released by the, the Buffalo Bills, they picked me up right away. I didn't even really leave the parking lot of Buffalo yet. And my agent called. Uh, the Falcons got the news that I was released, and they wanted me to fly in in the very next day to take a physical. And there I was with my new team, the Atlanta Falcons. So that's how we met. And what a great three years I had, which I wanted to play more years to play with you. But uh, unfortunately, the Falcons made a bad decision. <laughs> and, they, and they didn't re-sign me quick enough. And the Cardinals came calling. And uh, that's when I had to really make a family decision and uh, stick with baseball. Brian, when I was growing up, I needed I had glasses. And I never liked wearing the glasses, the contacts, the rec specs or anything. So when I would play baseball, it just looked like a blur. I couldn't even see the buzz. A blur would come out and I'd swing it. I was so young. I mean, I'm talking about like before high school even. Oh, really? <laughs> I just see a, a white blur. That's, hey, that's the way I feel right now. I should be having my glasses on, man. It's, <laughs> golly, my sight is going fast. I cannot read without glasses. Let's reminisce about our time together with the Atlanta Falcons, shall we? You were in the defensive back room. Were you blown away by Deion Sanders? <laughs> I think everybody's blown away from Deion. I mean, you know, one, this guy could study film. He knew he could watch film and tell you everything that's going to happen. I mean, he was just so talented, not just on the field, but in the classroom. And honestly, it got to the point where when Deion talked, you listen. And... You know, we had a fun, fun defensive back room. I mean, it was all about jokes, laughing. We had a crazy coach. Uh, so that defensive back room was a lot of fun, man. We just laughed, joked. But when it came down to it, uh, we knew what we were going to do that week. And Dion had a lot of say in, in a lot of things. I mean, he was one of those guys where I would just look at him and let him shut down the whole side of the field so I could be more aggressive and help others uh, because that's how good he was. So uh, I tell everybody, Dion talked it, but he walked it. And uh, that's why I had nothing but respect for Dion and, and, and my other teammates also. That's one of the things my, my dad used to say about Dion when I was growing up is he used to say, everybody sees like the show and the chains and the, and the flashiness. Mm -hmm. But he said in the, in the team, like in the meeting rooms, he was one of the hardest working guys there. So it's, it's hearing you say that it's a, uh, you know, full circle. Yeah. I, guess. I mean, he made everybody around him better. And uh, you talk about leadership. Uh, you look at him coach right now. I mean, he, he has that quality. He has that quality. You know, if he talks, you better listen because he's going to kick some knowledge to you, but he is way ahead of the game. He knows what's coming. That year was an ugly season. Remember Marion Campbell bailing in week 12 and Hammy took over as the head coach. He came into the locker room lit up like a Christmas tree and he had a machine gun bullet that everyone had to touch on the way out and we'd lose. And the next week it was an anti-aircraft bullet, then a grenade, then an anti-tank missile. And the final game they called the U-Haul Bowl because the players lot was full of U-Haul trailers. So when the game ended, they could split town. <laughs> yeah, so when I came in, it was definitely chaotic, man. You know, coming from Buffalo with a more accomplished team, uh, coaching staff, and then I come to Atlanta with Marion Campbell and the coaching staff, and it was going downhill fast. And, uh, you know, we just had a, a, a couple of leaders. You know, I look at you, I look at Dion. You know, you talk about guys who still led by example, but just didn't have enough talent around to to get everybody to join in. And I remember my first weeks in Atlanta, I was on injury reserve just watching and observing. And I was just like, wow, you know, what a big difference from Buffalo to Atlanta to Atlanta Falcons. And uh, but. I was happy to see Jerry Glanville come in and, and really kind of change that culture and, and change it in a, in a fast way. Tim, you, you remember those times when, when Jerry Glanville came in, how hard it was in training camp and mini camp uh, 
he quickly had to adjust everybody's mindset, uh, which he did a terrific job of. And and you, uh, one, play with so much emotion because, you know, that was in you. But with Jerry Glanville, it became in every one of us. We we ran around the field having fun. Uh, you know, it was about family and it was about uh, building a connection. And that's something that, that we had and, and, and we had a lot of fun doing it. So, yes, thank God Glanville came in and took over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jerry Glanville came in and changed the culture. I loved him, but he was crazy. He was known for wearing all black and leaving tickets for Elvis at the will call to every game. He was also known for a vicious brand of defense. You know, it was to me, it was a breath of fresh air to bring somebody in with that type of personality that you're sitting there saying, this guy's crazy for leaving tickets for Elvis, but it has to be something behind it. And then as the season go on, we bring in MC Hammer, Van the Holyfield. We bring in country singing groups. Uh, I mean, it was all a game, but that game really paid off. Uh, like you said, the grits blitz and, you know, that defensive mindset that Jerry Glanville had really came in and changed the culture. And uh, uh, to me, it, it was a lot of fun. It was hard work. You, you know, <laughs> all the running that we had to do and all the hitting we did in training camp. Uh, you, you really thought Jerry Glanville was crazy, but it, it paid off and it made us all better as a, as a team. And to me, it was a lot of fun when you, you got MC Hammer and everybody on the sideline and it really brought the fans back into the stadiums too. And uh, we would fill the house and it was, it was just a loud crowd and, and, and a lot of fun. Troy, let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. So when, when the illness took over your dad, did he try to motivate you to not play football or did he let you? That's a good, that's a good question. So uh, when we first, when he first got diagnosed, I mean, we acted like it didn't happen. So him and I were still mm -hmm. lifting together and I was still going to practice. I was playing at Syracuse. I transferred from UCF to Syracuse. But it okay. he wanted us, his whole thing was he wanted all of us to, he didn't want to be something that slowed us down. So when he, if we wanted to play football, he would be the, the sit in the front, front stands, front of the stands and cheer us on and drive us to the games and coach us and whatever. But if we didn't want to play, uh -huh. It was also no pressure. I mean, when I was growing up, my dad tried to talk me into playing soccer because I was pretty good at soccer. And then I was like, no, I'm, I'm playing football. And then, but when I was at Syracuse and we knew like my dad started having issues, it was, I mean, it was uh -huh. hard to play. Like when I would go out, I would like, I got my position changed from quarterback to receiver. And when I would like, anytime there was contact, I'd be like trying to put my head out of it, you know, which is not, you can't play football that way. You get eaten alive. So it really, yeah. So he didn't, he didn't discourage me. And then my younger brother, I actually have a, I have a brother who's uh, who's 12 years younger than me. So he was, uh -huh. he was doing little league. And uh, my mom was like, he is not playing. And my dad said, my dad wasn't saying he's going to play. My dad was saying, if he wants to play, then he's going to play, you gotta which is very, very yeah. different than like trying to push him to play. And uh, right. I mean, we had some really tense, my dad actually wrote a kid's book. It's called final season and it's like middle grade age and it's very close uh -huh. to being what actually happened he used all of our uh he used all of our middle names instead of our first names so like the the, the kid who wants to play football his name is ben and my younger brother is ty benjamin the brother who doesn't want him to play and the mom and that was me and my mom and then the brother that right. wants him to play if he wants to is my older brother and my dad and the compromise, you'll like this, Brian. This is this is right out of my my dad's uh, insane insane brain. The compromise was that we would he would do one last year. I would coach the offense. My older brother would coach the defense, and my younger brother would play just offense. And my dad was the head coach. And uh -huh. I mean, we were when I say nuts. I mean, we had we ran a no huddle offense. And we had board, like whiteboards like what Oregon does on the sidelines for the plays. And the right. other teams, like they're like, guys, we're trying to get a play in. Like, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, oh, get on the line, get on the line, run it, run it. So <laughs> we end up, uh, we played the last season. It was a great memory and ended up, that actually book, my dad wrote hit number one on New York Times bestselling books. 
And uh, really? the dad in the book is, is, you know, gets diagnosed with ALS. That's the only, the only thing that's um, not the only thing, but one of the, the things about the book that's not, you know, real is he basically took like a two or three year period and crammed it in like one. So in the beginning of the book, the dad's walking and talking, everything's fine. And the, the end of the book, he's in a wheelchair, which really for my dad, it took a couple of years to get there. But my dad, it's funny, I'm t- talking like you're not here, dad, but my dad has no animosity towards football. I have a ton of animosity towards football. I'm, I'm right. And it was such a big part of my life and it was so much of who I am and what I learned growing up and the life lessons and the friends and the coaching and all that. But I'm like, I don't watch nearly as much football. I'm not nearly as into it as I once was, but my dad still, right. my dad still loves it. I, I, I'm a part of me. I always love it. Cause how there's such a beauty to it, but I, I'm more bitter than he is about it. Oh, that's wild. Okay, man. Thanks for answering that, man. That's, yeah. I wouldn't... My dad says if he could go back, he would he would do it all the same. Do it all the same? Uh, yep, yep. If I could go back, I would have played a couple more football seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Glanville also had nicknames for everyone he liked. Yours was baseball. Do you remember mine? I can't. I can't remember off the top of my head, man. It had to be something like Psycho. Because <laughs> your dad would he would be Psycho when a big play was made. Holy cow, man! I tell you, I've been hit harder by your dad than anybody. <laughs> I've seen the every time I see the uh, the videos, like the highlight videos, is always headbutting everybody. Headbutting everybody. It's awesome, man. <laughs> but just that excitement, man. It was it was great. In his thick southern drawl, <laughs> he would just say 99. Well, Glanville had names for everybody, man. Called you the numbers then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Highway 22. Remember who he called Highways 22? I can't laugh with this machine, but that still cracks me up to this day. Highway 22. Who was number 22? Uh, Tim Micaiah? <laughs> uh, Tim Micaiah. I saw him talk about yeah. this in an interview. He said, I didn't know his name, but he said he called him that because the guy was always open. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah. Either yeah, that was, <laughs> either Charles Dimery. I, I think it might be Charles Dimery Highway because I remember uh, Jerry Rice scoring like five touchdowns against – it was unbelievable, Charles Dimery. Oh, <laughs> you called him Highway. Highway Twenty Two. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other? Uh, are there any other favorite Glanville stories you have, Brian? Holy cow, man! You know Jerry Glanville. The first year he came in, you know everybody who made the team. He made it mandatory that we had to get on two buses. And how do you take football players to Fat Tuesdays to celebrate? I couldn't believe it as a player. And I remember being at Fat Tuesdays. Some guys in one corner shooting dice. You got other guys just drinking. And Glanville's in the middle of the dance floor just dancing and having fun. (laughs) And all of a sudden, Bill Fralick and John Rady and a couple other linebackers started getting in an argument. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is not going to end well. And all of a sudden, because offense and defense, we used to fight every practice with Jerry Glanville. I mean, that's how intense he had practice. And they started arguing. And all of a sudden, the bouncers tried to step in. And, boy, it's fights breaking out. Jerry Glanville, drunk in the middle of the floor, he tells everybody to jump on the bus because <laughs> everything's breaking loose now. And so I get on that first bus because I'm like, I want to be no parts of no fights, nothing. I want to get back home because my wife was pregnant and she was going to have a baby in the next couple of days. <laughs> so I jump on this first bus and the second bus shows up. And the window knocked out. I mean, he was fighting on the bus. So the next morning in meetings, Jerry Glanville said, well, it only cost us $25,000 fine with Fat Tuesdays. 
we're doing okay. And that's when I knew <laughs> we were going to be a pretty good team, man. I was like, who takes football players to Fat Tuesdays? <laughs> but that was Jerry Glanville, man. That's hilarious. <laughs> I don't think your dad was in the middle of those fights. I'm not sure, though. <laughs> I wasn't in that fight, but I do remember how crazy that night was. Remember Coach Glanville used to say things like, Fat Tuesdays on Wednesdays because Thursday's a Friday. A different time there because Jesse Tuggle and I held out during our contract negotiations. Coach Glanville said Jesse and I had to pay for everyone's drinks at Fat Tuesdays. What Coach didn't know is that I had gotten his credit card from his secretary before we went out. So when the bill came, I had the waitress use his credit card and deliver the bill to him. Troy, you should have seen his face when they brought him the bill. And he realized it was paid with his card, not ours. <laughs> oh, those drinks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Now we come to the sad part of the story, not for you, but for the team. The linchpin to Glanville's defense was a guy who could play like a linebacker in the run game, and if the other team passed, he had to be able to cover. An extraordinary athlete that you couldn't find every day. The second year with Glanville, we went to the playoffs. Then the bottom fell out because we lost our linchpin. The rest is history. Can you tell Troy what happened? You know, Glanville brought the defense up to par, and we played very aggressive. Uh, you know, I love my position at strong safety because I played like a linebacker and very aggressive on the runs. And, you know, like you said, don't pass times. He would take me out sometimes, but leave me in sometimes. Uh, but, you know, that second year when we went to the playoffs, I think everything was clicking. Everybody knew their job, knew their assignments, and it was just an awesome time. I mean, we were very aggressive, and we just beat New Orleans to get to that playoff, and uh, what a great year. Uh, unfortunately, though, if after that third year, you know, I left this great defense, and you guys moved into the new dome, and I just watched the bottom fall out. You know, it wasn't the same defense. Uh, of course, I patted myself on the back because I wasn't there. And I, I felt for you guys, my teammates, my family, uh, because you guys didn't have that force uh, to help. And, you know, for me, it was frustrating because I wanted to be there into that new dome, uh, all the excitement. Uh but, yeah, I had to make that decision to go play baseball with the Cardinals and, and then to play 15 more years. Uh, but it was unfortunate for the Falcons, unfortunate for me, uh, because I wanted to be there for you guys. So you were forced to go because the old ownership was too misguided and stingy to pay you. But you had an incredibly successful major league career for 15 years. And you may have been injured in football. In baseball, you were the Atlanta Braves cleanup batter for quite a while, and you didn't disappoint. Your batting average was typically over 300, and it jumped to nearly 500 when the bases were loaded. So would you compare for us the season in the NFL and a season in the majors? Wow, it, it's a tough comparison. You know, I remember going into the uh, playing Major League Baseball, getting drafted by the Cardinals, and I remember – Ozzie Smith, Willie McGee, and those great players. I used to call them wimps because I played in the NFL. And I was like, man, I played a tough sport. Baseball is like a wimpy sport. <laughs> and I remember playing my first full season at the major league level, 162 games. And I had a new respect for baseball players because what a grind mentally uh, a season is in baseball. And it's a, it's a little different because, you know, uh, the pressure is a little different. Baseball, you have no helmet to hide behind. You know, you got the fans right up on you, and you have to produce uh, every single day because you got to look over your shoulder because you got a minor league player that's playing great at Triple A. So it was different pressures in the game of baseball versus the NFL. You know, you got that one Sunday you're landing on the line, which I love to do. And, you know, Detroit 
just a part of your question, uh, I was not ready to go play Major League Baseball. I wanted to continue to play in the NFL uh, because I was just taken off, as Tim was saying. And uh, to have a really good season in, in football and saw the growth of our Falcons team just on a rise, uh, I wanted to be signed. And I made Glanville aware of that after that third year to hurry up and sign me because I knew the Cardinals were coming. You know, I felt the pressures of the Cardinals starting to see how I performed on the baseball field and wanted me for full time. And I went back uh, to Glanville and, and Ken Hirock. And I said, Hey guys, you got to sign me now because the Cardinals are going to sign me to a long-term deal and I can't turn down. And I remember that their comment to me, they were looking at a safety from Oklahoma, this big safety, which they ended up signing. And I, I kind of took it as an insult that they were looking at a safety to sign. And that made my decision easy. And when the Cardinals called, I went on and signed the deal. And I remember having this conversation with Dion just a couple of years ago when he was at Jackson State because he was still mad at me for leaving and signing in baseball. And so we kind of sat down and had the conversation about it. And he wasn't aware that, you know, they were looking to sign this big safety because, you know, they wanted to give this shot or they weren't going to pay me the money that I deserve. So Dion finally understood why I left and go play baseball. Uh, but he was upset for a while that I left, you know, our Falcon defense because, you know, we were we were headed in the right direction going into the dome. Uh, but they made the decision. Uh, they made it easy for me. And that's why I decided to go play baseball. Uh, plus, I had my daughter. I was married. I had a family. So it just made sense to, you know, have the health benefits and everything that comes with baseball sure. versus the NFL. So that's why I made the decision to go play baseball. And it really worked out for me 15 years. Unfortunately, I had to watch you guys go into the dome and, and not have the success that, that I felt like we were headed for, unfortunately. So, you know, it was, it was a big choice in my life. Uh, one that I look back on, yeah, I wish I would have had the opportunity to play a couple more years of football, but you know, 15 years of major league baseball is, is pretty good. We were talking about giving back and I am humbled to be talking to you because you have dedicated your entire post career life to giving to those less fortunate. Why don't you talk about the mission of your foundation? Well, uh, again, uh, my parents were my role models. You know, I watched my dad, you know, help kids that he didn't even know uh, play, the, play the game of sports uh, and give them stuff at times that he wouldn't even give me as far as money and, you know, just to make sure they're okay. Uh, so I grew up under this, you know, my mom giving kids hope. Uh, so I was motivated as a young kid that I knew if I was successful, this is what I wanted to do. And I remember starting my foundation in 1998, uh, playing baseball and, and I wanted to give back. I wanted kids to get their education. So we started providing scholarships for high school seniors that, you know, didn't have the resources, uh, single parent homes really deserved to go to college, but they weren't going to go. And without the help of my foundation and, you know, to sit down and, and interview these kids and hear their story, how resilient they are. Uh, that is my mission. That's my heart. Uh, and we have so many positive stories of the scholarships that we've given out. I mean, I've, I've given out over almost a million dollars worth of scholarships and to see these kids go on to be successful and come back and speak at my, my golf events, uh, that's what it's all about. And I wanted to do more. So never thought I would write children's books because I was that kid growing up that probably had dyslexia. I had no confidence in reading. And when I can share that story with some of these young kids today and then read my children's book to them and give them that book to take home so that they can self-teach themselves like I had to myself. You know, I was a visual learner and uh, I just had problems identifying letters and sounds. So I had to self-teach myself. 
because my mom would read to me all the time, but she didn't realize that I was a visual learner. She opened that book and showed me pictures. I could tell you everything about that book, but I could not read that book. And it's making an impact. You're giving kids all the things that you had growing up. You're truly providing for others. Well done, my friend. Thank you so much, Tim, for that. Uh, but that's the mission, man. That's that's what I want to do the rest of my life. You know, encourage and motivate kids to be successful. And, and through reading, get your education. I mean, you always have a plan B with education. I didn't forget that you were a fellow kids author and a best-selling author at that. I was just saving the best for last. Tell us about your inspiration for these books and the power of reading for kids. You know, Tim, it, it's crazy because, I, like I said, I never thought I'd be writing children's books. And I just can't sit down and write them. It has to come to me. And when it does, I got I to gotta write it down right away. And I've written six children's books right now. so And I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So when that thought comes in, I just write it out and it becomes a book. Uh, but... Again, my motivation was my mom, you know, educator, uh, always encouraging kids and giving them hope. And uh, that's what I want to do through children's books. You know, I want these kids to be smart. You know, I want them to not be like me and have no confidence, you know, in reading. I want them to be proud and loud when they read. So I'm going to continue to do what I do and hopefully continue to write more and more books. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Making it to the World Series in 1999 with the Atlanta Braves versus the Yankees. What is the biggest adversity you faced? I broke my leg, dislocated my ankle in the senior bowl. And I thought my NFL career would be over. Uh, but because of my Christian belief uh, and my Philippians 413, you can do it all. Uh, through Christ who strengthens you. What are you most excited about? Continuing to write children's books and, and impact the literacy world, getting kids to read. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Continue to be an inspiration, Tim. Uh, what you do, what you did on the field, uh, as far as inspiring guys like myself, uh, being motivated. Uh, but what you're doing now today is continuing to write books and continue to share messages. Uh, it's really, really impactful. So continue your successful work, my brother. <laughs> awesome. And then, Brian, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you one quick thing. We've got uh, the, the the podcast. One of the things that we do is at the end, we ask every guest who are a couple of people they know. They can be from sports, from, from writing, from baseball, from football. It could be anything. Who are a couple of people you know that you think we should try to have on the podcast? Well, I would, I would think the best of the best, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking the best of the best. And that would be LeBron James, a guy that does it on the court, but he does it off the court also, starting schools back in his hometown, you know, giving kids scholarships. To me, that's more impactful than anything they do on the, on the field or on the court. And LeBron James would probably be the top guy outside of my former teammate, Tim's former teammate, Deion Sanders getting him on air to have some fun. <laughs> Those are two great ones. All right. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you guys, man, for having me. Really appreciate it, man. And and Tim, man, miss you, brother. And Troy, you're doing a great job, man. Brian Jordan, my brother, you have done amazing things with your life. Athletically, you're off the charts being a two-sport professional athlete. But you have done much more as just Brian Jordan, the human being. I bet you have made your parents extremely proud. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. Thank you for having me, guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern US, Washington, DC, and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and of course Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. 
for cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to tackleals.com. Thank you.